Welcome to Playful Podcast, your guide into the underground scene where we discover topics on kink and electronic music every week. Don't forget to subscribe to not miss out on our next episode. We're excited to be here today with coach and mentor within Domination and Finding Your Fetish, Diva. In this conversation, we speak about dental fetishes, something that she specializes on herself and where they come from and if they are somewhat Freudian or not and how a session can look like. We also speak about how pain and pleasure are connected and how one can trigger and find their own fetishes and much more. Let's get to it. I am Amanda and this is Playful Podcast. Okay, <laughs> dental fetish. <laughs> so um, I uh, used to work for many years um, in a dental office. So I have medical background and when I started to work as a dominatrix, I started with a medical fetish because usually every dungeon has a gin chair or something like this. Um, but then I discovered that I, um, yeah, it's very interesting to, to be specialized on dental fetish and to explore this part more. And um, now this is one part of my work as a dominatrix. Wow, but what can people request with within the dental area? It's very um, different. So I have my own dental chair. It's fully equipped and it's look like um, a real dental office. So and I can do treatments. Of course, I'm not drilling, <laughs> but I can do a lot of things that uh, are also done in a normal dental office. And so this is the, the start of everything. But then I try to very yeah. very efficient money wise maybe <laughs> for the person also receiving like a little uh, filling in the tooth yet pleasure an, or like you know it's an investment in their fetish yeah definitely but they also get two in one hmm? two in one if you check their teeth y- yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> you can see it like this yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, but what could it... So it's mostly... Are they coming to you with mostly like vague ideas? Like I have this fetish about the dentist checking up on me and then dominating me. Or is it... Could it be more specific also? And if so, in what way could it be specific? Yeah, what is very interesting is that um, it could be that I think so that many people associate with uh, dental treatments pain. But um, it has very less to do with with pain experience. It has so much more to do with uh, giving up control, um, being cared at the same time and um, dominated. Um, So a lot of emotions are going with this experience. And also there are a lot of uh, fetishes for material or for specific treatments. Ah that are combined with this experience for a special fetish for medical gloves or surgical gloves. Oh, yeah, of course. For imprints. Ah, yeah. All right. For fixations. So this turned out to be your niche. It is my niche, yeah. yeah. Very interesting. And do you also do, um, like... Um, medical in other ways than in the mouth area like if someone would like you to stitch them or I have experience with it but I do it less because I'm I become much more specialized on in this area and I joined a lot and I have this this share I own so it's uh yeah closer for me to to work in this area I I yeah and it's um it's um very very satisfying for me because I loved my work in the dental office before. Yeah, I I don't want to work in this job again, but uh, many aspects of this work I, I enjoyed. So it's perfect for me to combine my dominatrix part with this medical part. and mm, Perfect. You created your own perfect job. Mm-hmm. I love that. So, but how did it start like because it's also a very unusual work if you think about like 
the typical jobs that are presented to you as a teenager, it's maybe what you said, more so a doctor or... Uh, uh, what did you say? Actress. Actress, exactly. Or a teacher. You know, these kind of jobs. How come you uh, discover that this was an actual job? Um, by an accident. <laughs> so I never planned it. And I uh, don't know a lot about BDSM before. Maybe just some cliches. What um, are some cliches? Sorry for interrupting. Like the things you you know from from movies or whatever, this leather mattress with a whip, the, ah, yeah. this hurting man. Ah, so, I, so just the stereotype and not the emotions that are involved or the psychology uh, behind it. Absolutely. When I get in touch with it first, I know nothing about it. Just a few cliches. And it was in 2013 mm. and a friend of mine um, met a guy who was a lot into BDSM and uh, a lot into pain especially and to be dominated and his thing that turned him on was the idea that not a professional is dominating and hurting him but just two friends that are coming to his apartment to uh, use all his equipment he has and just have fun with him and she asked me if I want to join this session and I said yes <laughs> And before that, what what did you do? Like, where did you come from? You know, it's like for, what was your experience within domination before that first? Nothing. 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 Absolutely. And did nothing. you have like, but you had friends who were involved? No. 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 I don't understand. Like, it's such a big. It could be, you know, sometimes a lot of people like to dip their toes in in something and being like, can I do this? Am I, you know, the, it mm. can also be about self-doubt because it's a very, it can be very intimidating to dominate someone. Did you ever come across those feelings? Um, intimidating? What do you mean? With yeah, this? like um, a lot to live up to, mm. kind of. Like it, to dominate another person uh, and to be so strong within your character can be, can feel, it can feel like, uh, oh shit, can I really do that? Can I be the person they're expecting me to be? You know, this kind of thoughts could come up. Yeah, I think it's all part of the process, becoming a dominatrix to 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 um, evolve this role, to find your own style. Um, yeah, this is part of it. But yeah. when I made this first experience, I don't was thinking so. No, really? Yeah, because I just said yes and I made this experience. It, it was uh, it was bizarre, it was fun and nothing more. So I just enjoyed it and I was thinking, it, yeah, it's a bit crazy. <laughs> um, and then I sessioned with this uh, slave uh, a few more times. And two or three years after this experience, I start to work in a dungeon. And then my journey of learning and becoming a dominatrix mm. began. But this was my, my start. Yeah. Oh, okay. What were some things that, that like rose within you when you got started? Were there any like topics that you had to deal with on your own hand kind of to, to get into the role? Understand. Yeah, I think a large part uh, of doing uh, sex work as well, but also uh, to find your dominant role is to know very well your limits mm -hmm. and to um, experience more and more your own style and how you want to work. Mm -hmm. So this was definitely uh, a process. Also to think of um, uh, what kind of clients I want to attract, what kind of sessions I enjoy the most. Yeah, exactly. You need a a kind of business plan. Yeah. Right. In all. And not not only business plan, but also an uh, idea who you are as a person exactly. and what kind of work you want to do. Yeah, I think that could be part of the business plan. Like, who do you want to attract? Who? What are your special like? USP gonna be and these kind of things very interesting and today you're also a coach and a mentor within like uh, dominance and also finding your fetish mm -hmm. which I am super excited about <laughs> so how 
come, you decided to take it a step further and become a specialist in this sense and like share your uh, knowledge. It comes by the time. Mm. So I also have background um, in body work and coaching area and also trauma sensitive work. What is that body work? Like massage? No. Um, how to explain it? Um, so the body has its own language. Yeah. Um, and it's very helpful to work with it and uh, to read it, but also work through touch. Um, so I n- not directly do body work in my sessions, but this uh, background of knowledge I have is helping me. So uh, this is how you can uh, work and touch a person without using your language, for example. So it's uh, it's a lot of work with the subconsciousness, let's say, and I, it's important to do a lot of things, otherwise it can be um, boring. Yeah, if you do always the same kind of of session, yeah. and I'm um, yeah, I'm very glad that I have different areas, also classical domination. Um, yeah, exactly. Lifestyle domination, servants, slave, but at the other hand, my patients and the dental fetish, yeah. the coaching as well. So yeah, I enjoy this. Why would you say it's important to help people getting to know their themselves better and getting to know their fetish yes <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a very empowering process to um, know yourself better and to know your sexuality better it else also includes um, some kind of shadow work or to work with your fears and I think a person who is aware of themselves in and is knowing um, what he wants and is standing behind um, his or her fetishes and desires is much more tolerant. It's also a benefit for the whole society if, if people are more aware with their sexuality and with their own. It's um, yeah, it's a process of uh, self confidence, self care, self love. And I think it's it's very important. Yeah, definitely. and it's a lifetime process. So it's nothing that you discover it and then it ends. So it's uh, moving forward and um, yeah, constant development. Yeah. How could, for example, the process look like? Like, uh, if we were sitting here and I wanted to find my own fetish, as yes, fetish. Uh, what would be some things that you could like ask me, or, or where could you could we start? Like, yeah. So normally, a coaching starts when a person is coming to me with a fetish. So, ah. if the topic is fetish, so I think a, a real fetish is something inside you. You doesn't have to go to find your fetish, mm. um, but it's there and you want to understand it better or to deal with it better. So I think the beginning of this journey is maybe the first step to start to um, learn how to talk about it, how to talk about your needs, about your desires and to share it with me Mm -hmm. or with other people. So this is the the, the first step to of acceptance, I would say, and the first step of the journey to to discover it. Yeah, there was a question that I woke now uh, uh, within me where I thought like well there are some people who have fetishes that are also illegal like how could you help them understand and how would you work with that if that was the case I have never had this case it never happened that someone was like into kids or you know these kind of I never have this no never okay so I think it's it's rare. Maybe it's also a cliche of fetish that they are perverted. Well, they something. could be, no? They, they could be, like yeah. we, I think we all, all humans have mm-hmm. have fetishes. That's at least, at least what I, I think. But I just think that some people have like such troubles 
troubled backgrounds, mm-hmm. that it could be a huge help if someone would speak to them about, you know, mm-hmm. help them understand. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. what you do. So I was like, wow, this is something that could be so helpful also in that perspective of like making them understand that they could take other ways or, you know, mm-hmm. like... Yeah, yeah, I know what you are meaning. Mm-hmm. I think it's a difference if a, if a fetish um, is harming other people and is illegal or if a fetish is uh, maybe triggering some some social rules or um, things that are accepted or not accepted in the society. And in BDSM, we often have situations or role plays or fantasy that are not... Um, accepted in the normal life mm. so but this is a difference when it's between two people that are okay with it and it's a role play for example mm. then then it's not harming someone and it's consensual yeah but i never have this case that somebody wanted to do something illegal no yeah. all right anyways you've been in this business for almost 10 years now Yeah, so my first experience was 10 years ago, but uh, 2016 I started to work as a professional. Ah, How do you feel that the climate has changed? Like, you know, like before, do you feel that we are more accepting about sex today than we were before? Mm, I started not in Berlin, Mm. so for me... Something changed when I moved to Berlin. Um, it was a different climate. Um, yeah, and I can see that, that BDSM and kink is becoming more and more a trend. I could feel it when I moved to Berlin. So I definitely feel the difference between other cities in, in mm. Germany. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So let's say, so I would come to you with the fetish and you'd help me understand it can there also be a process on how i can find new fetishes Mm -hmm. i would not use the word fetishes Mm. in the closer meaning um but of course we can uh, experience and find new sexual preferences new kinks uh, new kinds of experience bdsm and all of this yeah yeah okay That's perfect, because I want to know the difference between a fetish, a kink, and a preference, sexual preference. Yeah, I think in the the informal language, uh, we use it as the same. Mm. The word fetish is also a trend word, so everybody (laughs) uses it. I make a difference in my work, so um, if I I work with a, if I have a session with a fetishist or with someone who has sexual preferences. So for me, a fetish is uh, like a um, lifetime devotion and uh, something you you have inside you and um, it's, it's, it's much more focused and detailed and uh, it's like a real desire mm. for something very specific, like a body part or um, an object or a material. Yeah, and often it's combined. So you have you can have one or two fetishes, but at the same time you have a lot of preferences, and you can be into domination and into fixation on, on medical, um, enjoying medical environment. But then you have this one specific fetish, which, for example, is um, are gloves or medical yeah. clothes or something very specific, and this is the the difference yeah oh yeah exactly so when i work together with fetishists uh, i pay much more attention to a lot of details because i know for them uh, many many specific things are very important how could a conversation look like then are you speaking about like yeah because i'm interested in this like Freudian way of thinking also that mm-hmm. like sex is so connected with childhood and uh, mm. the parents and dreams you know all of these things what's your view on that mm. how a fetish is starting or where it's coming from yeah I guess yeah. yeah so I know some people they are remembering very well and exactly uh, where it comes from 
so they have made a key experience. Um, maybe it was a traumatic experience, but also a very beautiful moment mm -hmm. that was triggering for, for them. Um, and other people are not remembering where it's coming from. Okay, but how could a traumatic experience be something you want to, uh, you know, experience again sexually? How does that yeah. work? Um, I, I think the dental fetish is a good example. Yeah. Some of uh, the people have experienced a um, nice moment on the share, being cared of uh, or pampered uh, <laughs> and the touch or the uh, dentist was, was nice, whatever. Some of them uh, have had their first erection on the chair. Ah. Others are um, associating um, specific emotions like uh, fear or being controlled or embarrassing moments. Um, so it, uh, yeah, it could be a, a positive experience of something or a negative. And somehow... Um, it become sexually charged. This experience from the childhood um, become more and more sexually yeah. with the years. Like shameful situations can they also hold so much emotions that it's like okay that you kind of create a portal for them to come out. Yeah, or it's something inside you that uh, want attention. Ah, yeah. Or something inside you that is creating nice feelings again, mm. again, so that you want to repeat it. So I see a fetish more holistic. So it's not something that all only has to do with your genitals or with an erection. So, but it's an it's a mix of of uh, nice feelings yeah. that you can create again and again inside of you and that you want to repeat yeah and i guess like what is very important also within the domination work is that the control part of it that the submissive is also very much in charge is that also something that brings them you know i mean to know like they repeat it's it's a psychological work in that sense like now yeah. they're repeating it but they're yet the ones in control of the situation which they weren't the first time. Is that also something exactly. you think? Exactly, yeah. What is interesting is that um, fetish is often combined with dental phobia. So it goes hand in hand and the people are panicking when they are sitting on the, on the chair. Mm. So I can work with this fear. But at the same time, they, they want to make this experience. And um, yeah, I can give them special support and guidance but from this dominant role. So I also force them into this situation. It's a, it's a nice psychological mix. I, I like it. Yeah, it's a, like a little game. Yeah. Also this, this idea of um, I taking care of you and I know exactly what you need, but you need to go through this. And yeah. I'm giving you support, but there is no way out. So it's a very interesting psychological mix of, of dominance and care. How do you feel that if you compare like how the, I wanted to say patient, which is very funny. <laughs> <laughs> they are patients. <laughs> the client, how would you say the client uh, can uh, differ when it comes to the feeling they enter the room with compared to the feeling or the, yeah, the feelings they uh, exit the session with? Mm -hmm. I think it's a normal process of beginning a session and have the highlights in the session and to have a smooth ending and an aftercare. Can uh, they be nervous at the start when they end Yeah, there? yeah, yeah. But oh. it's a, also a part of it. So. Yeah, exactly. That's what I meant. And then afterwards... Do you can you feel that they are relieved in some yeah, way or yeah. like they are very happy and and relieved and mm. so after a BDSM session it's normally a high euphoria. <laughs> oh. 
We have now come to the part of the podcast where if you're a Patreon, you'll get to listen to the masterclass where Diva shares her insights on how you can start explore your own fetishes, sexual preferences and kinks, as well as how you can speak to a partner about them or their kinks without judgment. Go to patreon.com slash playful magazine. <laughs> yes. All right. Because you... Um you are so overwhelmed and maybe after you are tired, but after, directly after the session, I think you are more euphorical about everything. And uh, you are also in the subspace, so if if you are sub... Mm. Are there some you've been working with for many years? Can you Do you have some clients that you have been working with for yeah. many years? Yeah, yeah. How is it to see the progress or, you know, like how they are evolving? Do you feel that it's like an intimate relationship? It is, yeah. Of course, there's also a healthy distance. And yeah. the distance uh, because of the power dynamic. Must be. But, um, yeah, it's a journey. And you learn uh, a lot about he- them. And, um, yeah, support them in their process. And the session becomes deeper and deeper with the time because you you know who the person is, which kind of buttons you can press, yeah. which are the trigger points. What I wanted to mention about the point uh, how fetishes uh, start. Mm. So it doesn't need always to be a specific experience. It could also be that um, some fetish is a symbol for you or uh, association with something. So if you make an example, um, um, fetish for uniforms, like it's a symbol of power and you doesn't to make a uh, bad or good experience with somebody who is wearing a uniform. It's enough that you are watching movies or... Like authority kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. kinks. And so many kinks, also like high heels, nylons, can become the um, symbol for femininity or leather... And leather over knees, symbol for dominance. Mm. So it doesn't mean that you always need a background story to to have a fetish. Exactly. It's very complex. It Fetishes is. are very complex. Do you feel that you were always like empathic? Or like had an easy time to connect with other people and feel empathy for them and like naturally curious about what they've been through and these things? Yeah. It feels like that's a very important thing like you're also in some way a psychotherapist I think empathy is very important when we work with people in general Mm -hmm. and I think every dominatrix should be empathic which they are (laughs) yeah and it's uh it's not a conflict so you can be very strict and very dominant and uh guide someone through the session in a sadistic style, if necessarily, but be at the same time empathic. It doesn't mean that you are not consequent. Do you feel that um, taking the step to becoming a dominatrix made an impact on your social life? Like, Do you feel that it was a step in a direction that some people couldn't understand? and that could, could not understand? Yeah, like and accept. Mm-hmm. Or did it feel like everyone yeah. were like, okay? At the beginning, I was keeping uh, keeping it secretly. So ah. Not from all people, but I was not talking a lot about it. Um, then um, I become more and more open with it. Now I'm totally <laughs> open with it and I have never experienced uh, problems. Yeah. Nice. Okay, that's... Maybe I think in this sense, like Berlin can be very... Uh, giving city mm-hmm. you can feel like and i'm okay a, yeah, anyway yeah. to it's okay to stand like a little bit outside society it's, and, and here you're not so uh, here you're like <laughs> you know here you're in your work is definitely normal mm-hmm. uh, nobody is interested <laughs> people are like oh you're a dominatrix ah very okay. interesting how do you work next week could we have a coffee <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no it's really nice yeah Oh, well, we have been speaking a lot about this, so maybe it's like me going into the same subject, then you let me know, and we just take it all out. But, um, like, 
do you think that you find your fetishes or your fetishes find you? <laughs> it goes hand in hand. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you need to accept that you have this fetish and there's no way out. So it's it's you. Yeah. You need to accept it and sometimes you you can explore some things or maybe you have a partner uh, who having a fetish and then you start to share together and you discover that you like it so the fetish finds you um yeah everything is possible i'm also very intrigued by that but we are going to speak a little bit more about the part of uh relationships and when your partner has a fetish and Mm -hmm. how to Mm -hmm. talk about that soon but i am also curious about like the way that uh, pain and pleasure are connected because some people say that they are very similar and I have a hard time wrapping my head around this. Um, I think it's depending on the person and the kind of session and the kind of pain. So if it's a session with someone who is into pain, masochist, Mm. um, then pain and pleasure are connected directly. Could be also that uh, pain is used as... um, Last pain, so you are balancing between this this curve of, of pleasure and pain all the time, so it's um, not about extreme pain, but um, erotical pain, then it's also connected with each other. Do you think that, uh, now that, that we are on this topic, do you think that it could be uh, a, re- a way of repairing those traumas? Do you understand what I mean? That this could be the actual opposite mm-hmm. of an abusive relationship in that sense. That going, if you have been through an abusive relationship, then going to a to a dominatrix mm-hmm. where you are the sub and you are actually knowing that you're in control could help you heal. Mm-hmm. It is possible to to repeat traumatic situations and to write them new. And when I do it, I'm always very aware. Um, to balance between um, not re-traumatize somebody because this can happen happen very quickly that somebody <laughs> is recreating this trauma and go into freeze or out of body experience or whatever and this is not that what we want so it's a very um, it's an area that we <laughs> should enter very carefully yeah. and aware but it's possible yeah to um, recreate a situation new and to help the person to be empowered from it, to have control over the situation. This is the ideal way. Mm. Yeah. So I always try um, also in the sessions uh, on the dental share to balance between um, making a lot, but not too much so that the person is always in the state that they can handle it would happen, even if it's hard or a lot, but never too much. Do you have any no goes? Like when your client asks you for something, is there some things that you are like, the, this I'm not doing this because of that or that reason? Or I, I think the list of my no goes is long. Ah, okay. So it would be a, a lot to tell about <laughs> everything. You can find it's it online. Easier, <laughs> it's easier to... Uh, yeah, I try to put the focus on the things I, I like to do. Yeah, smart. But of course I have no goals. Like if I see that someone is totally into guilt or is not uh, aware about their kink but want at the same time experience it with me, um, this is a situation I don't like, then this person should uh, do For coaching first. <laughs> but I was going to say first <laughs> therapy and then you. <laughs> but not but not to book a, book a session because I want somebody who is aware mm. about their kinks. Um, yeah, this is, for example, a no-go. Yeah, were you ever in that situation uh, that you were with the client who didn't wasn't aware and you realized like, okay, this is the last time I'm doing this? Or how did you realize that? This is very rare because I try to communicate well before. Mm. So the process of appointment, um, there is a chat before, before the session and also communicating via email. Mm. 
in advance so I can get a very good feeling uh, who the person is and I'm very intuitively there so I choose very well I want to session with because it's important for me that it's a good experience for both of us. Yeah, so I feel it in advance if something is not working. Also, if a colleague maybe is better for this person, then ah. I can make a recommendation. Yeah, because, because you have somehow uh, a community of uh, co-workers, I was going to say, but they're not... Really colleagues. Like, colleagues, colleagues, exactly. Yeah. 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 Cool. Who you are close with mm -hmm. or all right. How do you think you benefit from each other? Oh, in so many ways. Like in, in, in other work in every work you benefit from each other, from the experience you can share. Um very simple things like photographers or <laughs> uh, some e experience with advertising and all of this, but also the exchange of sessions of the psychological parts of the experience it's, it's sometimes it's just friendship yeah you don't need has to do something with your work true or with same clients true You're just people you like and you met through work and connect with yeah yeah wow this was it for playful podcast this week but please follow subscribe and listen to our next episode and if you want to have a say about future artists or even ask your own question to one of our guests, follow us on Instagram and make sure to add your question when we lift our coming guests. Thank you so much for joining and see you next week.